In a series of truly fantastic magical installments, Chamber of Secrets is unfortunately the least fantastic. While Sorcerer's Stone does a solid job at effortlessly setting up Harry's world, Chamber of Secrets does little to further readers' understanding of this world or the characters within it. Instead, the book gets consumed in a plot filled with unseen monsters and the petrification of students, which is terrifying and gripping in its own right, but doesn't offer much in the way of lasting character development. I spent much of the book wondering if Harry might be the heir of Slytherin, and what that might mean for his future, only to find out that he's not, while simultaneously dealing with the loss of Hermione for far too many chapters. Yes, the introduction of Tom Riddle is a thrilling twist, but the rest of the novel is lacking the quieter everyday moments of Hogwarts life. Intimate exchanges in the common room or light-hearted squabbles in the Great Hall are some of the best bits of the series, and Chamber of Secrets could certainly use a few more of them. Off to the races with a little controversy. Out of the whole series, Chamber of Secrets unfortunately ranks at the bottom. While the first book pulled readers in with its fantastically designed world and introduced the characters effortlessly while having the subplot of Voldemort in the background, the second book is a lesser follow-up. The Basilisk plot is terrifying and quite gripping, but ranks as perhaps the most run-of-the-mill plot of Harry Potter's canon, a monster of the weak story that doesn't deepen the characters much, nor does it truly advance the series forward. The loss of Hermione for numerous chapters hurts the book too, removing the essential power trio that is the series' strength. It's not bad, but it's definitely the weakest of the novels, although the plot twist of Tom Riddle gives it some bite near the end. You always remember your first, and Sorcerer's Stone is no exception. It was the one that started it all, the one that introduced me to the boy who lived and made me fall in love with the magical world I was discovering alongside Harry. There's a certain nostalgic sheen on the first Potter installment, but looking at it critically, Sorcerer's Stone doesn't fully stand up to most of the series' later books. Reading it now, it feels too brief, rowling breezes through months of the school year that would occupy hundreds of pages in later books, and the world itself is just a fraction of its realized potential. Still, it does exactly what the first book in a seven-part series should do, introducing readers to the most important characters, acclimating us to our environment, and building a setting we'll want to come back to again and again. I wish it had more details about Harry's first year, but later books had those in spades. The first book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, will always remain a classic for its introduction to the world of the Potterverse and the characters within, fondly remembered in the minds of many readers. However, J.K. Rowling clearly hadn't solidified her style yet, and under critical scrutiny, it certainly doesn't stack up against most of the other books. The first book is quite short, and it's a breezy read, with Rowling blasting through huge amounts of the school year without paying it the great amounts of detail that would become a trademark of the later books. The world also feels less fleshed out and considerably more childish, but even so, this is the book that made our love of the series last forever. A solid red, Goblet of Fire fits comfortably in the middle of the pack. Jumping from Azkaban's 317 pages to a formidable 636, this installment is the first of the long, heavy Potter novels we now know and love. Goblet of Fire offers a lot of good, from our introduction to the Truizard Tournament, and a whole slew of new characters to some jabs at humor around the Yule Ball and Moody's general antics, until finally we're asked to watch as Voldemort chillingly returns to his human form. Still, this book doesn't stand up to a reread quite as well as some of the others, as the tournament structure makes things a little more regimented, predictable, and even boring on subsequent reads. And while Cedric's death hit me hard the first time I read Goblet of Fire, the murder of this somewhat minor character is much easier to swallow when you know the kind of brutal tragedy that is to come in the series. Goblet of Fire has a lot of good, with its tournament-style structure offering a break from the usual clichés of the series, offering a new and exciting series of scenarios for Harry to tackle. Characters are deepened even further here as the cast begins to grow up, with the Yule Ball sequence, an excellent demonstration of how much more adult Harry and his friends have become in their fourth year. The ending is also fantastic, with Voldemort's chilling resurrection and return to power. Still, the overall structure does become repetitive on subsequent reads. 
Cedric's death is well handled, but in hindsight, Cedric's death is telegraphed miles away, considering he was a new character and not a main member of the cast. Still, it's a shocking moment and the book helps move the series into its darker tone. Easily the most polarizing of the Potter novels, Order of the Phoenix, offers the series' highest highs and lowest lows. This lengthy book might as well be titled Harry Potter and the Struggles with Puberty, and fans of the franchise certainly know why. Harry spends most of the novel slumping around Hogwarts, complaining that Dumbledore is ignoring him, lusting after a grieving Cho Chang, and being unnecessarily prickish to Ron and Hermione. While his behavior is entirely justified, considering he's a moody 15-year-old whose friend recently died in his arms, it doesn't make for a very fun read. Still, Order of the Phoenix is able to redeem itself because of its wondrous highs. I love the discovery of the Order itself, the establishment of Dumbledore's army, and the glorious, tragic battle at the Ministry. While forces of evil threaten beloved characters in ways I never thought possible, the budding rebels also fight back. Chapter 29, Career Advice Alone is Reason Enough to Love This Book, and Fred and George's Legendary Escape will go down as one of the greatest moments in Hogwarts history. I've been told this was the most difficult to read of the series, and I found it to be true. Harry is full of teen angst and spends a lot of the book furious and being quite infuriating at the fact that nothing is happening and that when things do happen, he's not allowed to be involved. Of course not being allowed do things should never stop a boy like Harry Potter from getting involved, except that amazingly it does. This book isn't really so much about Harry Potter, but about all the other characters and the events that are sweeping the wizarding world. Harry eventually gets caught up with fighting the new headmistress Broad and do the great changes taking place outside Hogwarts, but he's more a witness caught up in events than an actor trying to sort them out. While the book lays a great deal of background information and sets up for the last two books, there isn't a strong central adventure story that makes this book stand alone. What results feels less like a story in the middle of a larger tale, and more like a closet where all of the information and loose ends that must be sorted to finish the series have been crammed in like so many bogarts. There is a ream's worth of scenes an editor could have blue penciled out to emphasize the story arc, with all essential events quite intact. Still the narration and dialogue is often enjoyable, and the actions that Harry does finally end up involving himself in become key in the end. While no fan of the Potter series ever really wanted it to end, Deathly Hallows let us go out on a high note. Beautifully wrapping up the series in a satisfying and largely unpredictable way, the seventh installment left me in tears of profound sadness and unrelenting joy. This stunning farewell to an epic journey forced readers to say goodbye to many of our favorite characters, as we endured a shocking, terrifying, exhilarating, and inspiring story that pushed the trio, and us fans, to our very limits. Still, Deathly Hallows is not without its faults, the epilogue being one of the worst, much of the middle of the book drags a bit as the trio moves from campsite to campsite, and Rowling's decision to let Harry sort of die but then come back to life feels like a slightly weak and confusing choice at this point in the game. In the end, though, the final battle of Hogwarts in the face-off between Harry and Voldemort was everything I could have asked for, and after all this time, I'll remember it always. This is the finale to the series, and it certainly lived up to the exceptions. It wrapped up the series as a very satisfying way, showcasing the entire cast of characters in a variety of ways, even in small cameos. It's not without its flaws, with the epilogue being controversial and the middle of the book dragging considerably as the trio travels through the wilderness, but the rest of the book, especially the final battle at Hogwarts, was everything we ever wanted and more. It's the finale we all wanted and minor flaws don't detract for what an incredible experience it was. The sixth installment of the Potter series is one that endures and persists and fights its way into my heart again and again. Late in the series, Half-Blood Prince finally finds a perfect Potter balance, striking a chord between intensely dark drama and lovable comedy, in a way that offers the best of both worlds. With a healthy portion of friendship drama and a good dose of exciting plot, 
Half-Blood Prince gives a poignant meaty backstory to Tom Riddle and lets readers inside the mind of Snape, one of the series' most complex and fascinating characters. The book teaches readers more about the Horcruxes, allowing us to feel closer than ever to finally vanquishing the Dark Lord before brutally facing the death of our beloved headmaster. And while it would have been easy for the silly relationship qualms among the trio and friends to seem trite in comparison to the rest of the book's dark themes, things like the Slug Club and Quidditch and Dates with 1-1 instead offer a charming and comical respite to the larger problems at hand. Half-Blood Prince is rich with humor, history and heartbreak, and I still can't get enough. This book is a high point of the series, striking a balance between dark drama and hilarious comedy in a perfect way. It provides a backstory to the series' villain, Voldemort, and deepens characters considerably, while throwing tons of twists into the mix about old ones, Dumbledore especially. Snape is also showcased for the first time as considerably more complex than he initially appeared to be, and the final twist of him being the half-blood prince is an exciting payoff at the novel's emotional climax, and that's saying nothing of Dumbledore's unexpected and emotional death at the book's climax. This is a heartfelt drama and masterpiece of a novel that truly solidifies Harry Potter's mature themes. When it comes to Harry Potter, it doesn't get better than The Prisoner of Azkaban. Rowling's third foray into the world of magic and mischief is the most endearing and enduring, painting a stunning portrait of Harry's past and the family he never knew. We see Harry truly begin to grow into his own, facing his fears as he defeats Dementors and conquers the demons his father left behind. Prisoner of Azkaban gives readers the pleasure of learning about the Marauders and brings to life some of the series' best and most beloved characters in Remus Lupin and Sirius Black. I fall in love every time with the two misunderstood outcasts who have been rejected by society and enjoy watching as our young trio overcome every prejudice to help Riemus and Sirius. Harry, Ron, and Hermione grow in empathy, wit, altruism, and general magical skill to save both the criminal and the hippogriff, and we see that James and Sirius's dedication to helping a friend at all costs did not die with the previous generation. Ironically, it's the story that's been touched least by Voldemort's evil, and yet it's the book that exemplifies everything the Potter series stands for, proving that nothing and no one is exactly what it seems on the surface. In the end, Prisoner of Azkaban is the Potter book I'll pick up again and again, always solemnly swearing that I'm up to no good. The third book of the series is truly the best of the books, despite being shorter than the later ones and early into the series' run. Here is where Harry comes into his own as a three-dimensional character, as opposed to simply a surrogate Tana point-of-view character for the young audience. Remus Lupin and Sirius Black make their introductions here, standing out as some of the best characters the series has to offer. It's the book that tugged at our heartstrings for the first time, and even though Voldemort is almost completely absent the plot is no less engaging for his absence. This book shows why we love Harry Potter and why we always will.